Okay. Um, please let me know if uh, if somebody can uh, give me a quick note to let me know you're hearing me okay. That would be uh, wonderful. Yes, but the audio is fine. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. And if you have any problems, please go ahead and use the chat window uh, or the uh, the answered questions window or the questions window and let me know. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is um, uh, this is a series of webinars. It's a collaborative project between the India Internet Engineering Society and the Industry Network Technology Council. Uh, the funding for this set of webinars is a grant from ISIF Asia. Thank you so much. Um, and um, uh, we have had uh, grants in the past with Aaron, and we have a subsidiary project also uh, along with Aaron. And so thank you to, to both AP, Nick, and Aaron. Uh, our vision is that this is a multi-year project. The goal is not just, of course, to train people, but to have actual implementation uh, at enterprises, IPv6 deployment, because at, uh, deployment at enterprises uh, has lagged, and uh, we would like for um, uh, these efforts to do some some small help at um, moving that forward. So we have a three-part vision. First is to provide training and then help with uh, security and application conversion. And we have a number of enterprises who are involved with us uh, in that. Um, and uh, you will be seeing results of that uh, coming out soon. And we are also actually starting to help some enterprises plan their IPv6 deployment. So please do plan to see more on that soon. And if you yourself would like to uh, chat with us about deployment, do please send us uh, a note. So, um, in terms of um, uh, of um, uh, classes, this is what we have done so far. Is um, we have um, uh, shown that we've had um, uh, the the intro, the and then a lab on the the basic uh, addressing and so forth. Uh, and then we did the neighbor discovery uh, um, and, uh, fundamentals and theory. And now, of course, uh, this is this is the lab. So uh, let me give a few words about the the, uh, the presenters. And it's, it's going to be mostly Mike. And so I'm I'm going to say just a, a, a couple of things about me. Uh, one of them is, is that I've been working with IPv6 for a reasonable amount of time. And I'm working on uh, actually additions uh, to um, the embedded performance and diagnostics for IPv6. Uh, and that is along with uh, my partner in crime, uh, Mike Ackerman. Uh, he too is working on some extensions uh, to for performance and diagnostics. And as we come along, then, then he and I will be talking quite a bit on uh, what those are. But Mike will be doing the bulk of the presentation today, uh, which is wonderful. Thank you so much um, for Mike. Um, he's a great presenter and a, and a great hands-on technical guy. He's the lead tech network engineer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. And for uh, those folks who are outside the United States, that's one of our very large uh, healthcare insurance companies. Uh, in the United States, we have uh, um, uh, we do not have um, a private, um, I mean, we have private health insurance, <laughs> so there we are. Um, and, but Mike has, again, a long, long um, uh, history uh, with networks uh, and so forth. Uh, he's very active uh, at the IETF and also at INTC. And um, as I say, I'm very happy to call him uh, a friend as well. So let's let's go ahead and get started because I know this is what you guys came for is to listen to the lab. So so let's go ahead. So let's let's we're gonna we're gonna see neighbor discovery in action. So off to Mike. Let me make him present it. All right. One moment. Him present it. Okay. All right. There we are. Okay. Thank you, friend. Um, can everybody see my screen? It isn't very exciting at this point. 
But, uh, just, yes, look uh, fantastic. Uh, so as Nalini said, what we're going to cover here is going to be what uh, the neighbor discovery protocol does. Uh, we're going to cover what happens when IPv6 is enabled and what roles that NDP plays in making some of these things happen. Uh, remember, and, and for those of you that attended Nalini's session last week, this is just a refresh that NDP replaces ARP from IPv4 but we're going to see that it also does a whole lot more so ARP's gone this is what we need to learn now and I'm struggling to do so and uh, welcome to my nightmare um, we'll um, we're going to see how to activate IBB6 and then we're going to see when and how addresses are assigned uh, we're going to see how that looks in actual console displays and that's the display that you see up there right now this is all going to be on an Ubuntu Linux server uh, it's uh, neighbor discovery is similar in all platforms. The implementation and command details that we're going to see are pretty much the same across all Linux platforms. Uh, I know a lot of you, including me, run RHEL, and we can talk about some of the differences there later uh, as time permits, but they're pretty identical. And most of all, this will be real and live uh so wish me lots of luck but but more seriously the reason we're doing it this way is that uh, what we think is that uh, a lot of enterprises such as mine and yours and and others uh, we're going to try to cover what we really need to know and understand as we begin to deploy ipv6 so this is live this is actually what uh, i'm trying to do right now and and what you all will be doing soon i hope or some of you have already done um, so the point here is to please ask a lot of questions as we cover this material. We'll be pausing frequently to solicit questions. And, and the reason for that is that what you think you need to know to get started with this and get going and be successful, that's what's most important. So, so guide us. So the good part of being live is that uh, we can turn in any direction uh, that the audience wants, that the needs dictate. So. Please be liberal with your questions. Nalini, I believe you will be monitoring the chat looking for questions. And then and when we have moments to stop, we'll we'll address the, the questions that we can. That's right. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Well, what what I'll do is if you want, you can use either the questions uh, panel, which comes only to the organizer, or if you want to send to the entire audience, which you may or may not wish to do. Um, you know, you can you can put it there. So either way, I will be looking at both. Uh, but if you want us to answer the questions, uh, then please. Go. It really, I think probably the questions window is preferable. Thank you so much. Okay, let's get started and cause some trouble. So I'm going to issue a, an interface configuration display screen, and let's see what we got here. Um, we have two interfaces, a loopback and an Ethernet interface. And pretty much all I got here that we really care about at this point is we do have an IPv4 address. Uh, so that's all probably pretty normal stuff to you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I am going to enable IPv6. And that's that's all there is to that. Now, you may do this in configuration files and it happens at reboot or service restart those kind of things but this is and they all end up being the same thing so that's that's the way uh we're doing it right now but they all end up being the same thing um so let's display that interface again and aha it looks a little different look what we've got we've got uh this address and it says inet6 in front of it which uh, that's how programs communicate with one stack or the other. They call IPv6 INET6. And this, because we, and, and again, for those of you that attended previous Nalini sessions, if it starts with FE80, that means it's a link local. And let's see if we have one other thing. We have a loopback address down here now, too. So we have an IPv6 loopback address. So those are the two exciting new things that we've gotten added. And let's talk just a little bit about scope. It, as we can see here, we have scope here on, on the um, 
move back address of hosts. That means this address is only good on this host, nowhere else. Nobody else can really hit this particular loop back address. And if we go up here back to the link local address, scope is called link. And, and link is IPv6 terminology for the local LAN. So anything that's MAC connected, uh, you know, some people would say a subnet. So anything I can talk to directly. And, and so that's what a link local is. Uh, and, and, the, and that's cool, but the link local can't talk outside of the link or the subnet. So what we can do with this type of address is, is really limited. So what we really want is something called a global address or a GUA. And that's an address that we can do almost anything with. And we can go across the internet or across the computer room or across our sites. Uh, but we don't have one of those. Now, what, what needs to happen uh, for us to get one of those is we need to define one or get one through various mechanisms. And, and, and some of the mechanisms uh, are the same or at least similar to IPv4. Uh, we can still do static addressing, which is very common in servers like this one. Uh, DHCP still works. And then um, IPv6 has a new thing called Slack or automatic auto address configuration. Uh, so you'll hear us refer to Slack a few times, and, and that's what we're talking about, this magical facility where addresses just come to us. And we didn't have to do anything, so that's actually pretty wonderful. You don't want to use it in all cases, perhaps, but it, it's just good to know it's there. And uh, it, it's really good for uh, smaller devices, less intelligent devices, remote devices. It's great for IoT. So keep it in mind, and we're going to see uh, an example of, of how this works right now. Um, one thing that causes us to get one of those magical Slack addresses is when the router sends a router advertisement. And he does that every five or 10 minutes. And let's see, he has not done it yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force him to send one. I have a little script here that I wrote. Um, that will cause that to happen. And uh, there he is. Okay. So the script is running now and it's soliciting that. And, and we're going to see what it causes. And later, time permitting, we're going to see in a trace what actually happened. But let's take a look at that same configuration display. And aha, aha, again, we have, and, and let's build a, a little tree here. We still have address that's the base thing that ipv6 needs to operate so that's always going to be there as long as we have ipv6 on if we think ipv6 is on and we don't see that there something's wrong and there's a whole bunch of things that aren't going to work i see a bunch of those things uh we still have um that for us and now we have this address and that address was generated by Slack. So the the uh, router sent his his advertisement, and then a few things happened, and we generated an address. For now, let's look at um, just the first sixty four bits. If I can possibly do that, and that's the prefix. What we'll see when we get to the trace is that the router, among other things, sent us. Hey, here's a prefix I have. You can kind of allocate whatever you want within that. And so the server put these bits in and voila, he has an actual address. Let's see if that actually works. Uh, and, and one thing I forgot to point out, what's the scope of that? It's global. That means I can go anywhere with this. Now, of course, routing tables and firewalls and everything still applies, but uh, the this address is capable of going anywhere on the internet or in your local area network. So let's see if anything might work. And yes, it did. So we're, we're pinging Google and, and, and this is pretty good on, on a couple of uh, fronts. One, that it worked, period. Uh, two, that we're talking to Google over IPv6. And what we can see here is that we have this 2607 address. 
And that's actually Google. And we're actually talking to Google over IPv6. Uh, another thing that that means is that we are somehow translating this word google.com into this address that means dns and so we got a dns server somehow i don't i don't know how that happened but we're going to figure that out too and and really one of the more interesting things is that i did a ping here i could have done a ping six which means only use ipv6 or i could have done a ping four and said only ipv4 i said just you know give me whatever you got we will see uh, what happens in the background is that he will put out an address request for google.com to both v4 and v6 he'll get both answers and he will choose to use ipv6 that's kind of important to us because all the operating systems and other products are starting to prefer ipv6 so if we as enterprises, operators, et cetera, whatever the heck we are, if we don't start using IPv6, we're gonna start using something that all of our platforms don't prefer. That's eventually gonna affect us in terms of availability and performance. So now um, I'm gonna do one more thing. So we, we, um, we have uh, our link local, we have our global, one thing a lot of us enterprises are probably going to do is we're going to probably want to use static addresses and, and i actually have some static addresses to find in this server but static addresses when you put them in a comp file it's usually they're going to get allocated and enacted at uh, say boot time or service restart time and, and and we have not done any of that so i'm going to go ahead and restart the network service and and then we'll see and let me talk about this just a little bit. There's, a, there's several different ways on different platforms to restart uh, services. One that's becoming probably the most common in, uh, in Linux environments is System D. So I'm going to use System D, but just so you know, and you probably already do, that there's other ways that you could restart this. So there he did it. Let's display our interface again. And now we got a whole bunch of things. Uh, and so let's build our tree one more time because this does get kind of confusing, at least for me. So here's our here's our link local. He's still there, nothing new. Uh, we still have our Slack address. So that's the one the router kind of magically gave to us. But now we have some more addresses and these are the actual addresses and they even match the ones that I put in the comp file. Uh, and, and what I did is I just took a couple that, that made it similar to the, the Slack address, and then I just pulled this two, three, four thing out of the air. But, but what that shows us is we can have multiple addresses. Um, I've been asked, you know, why would you want multiple addresses? And, and you may not, you don't have to have them, but if you wanna control the flow of things or limit certain things to inbound, outbound, or maybe have servers or, web servers or other products li listening on certain addresses. Uh, that way you can use the same port. So it just gives you a lot of flexibility. So uh, certainly not saying that we have to use multiple addresses, but saying that it's nice to know that it's there and, and we have that level of flexibility. So I don't think we've messed anything up. Um, let's see, is, is Google still working? Yeah, uh, I think I have a little ping for, uh, one other address that you knew. Where did you go? Well, I'm afraid I don't see it. I probably went right by it. Anyway, I was doing a local ping to our DNS server and then that works too. So right now everything's hunky dory. Everything's wonderful in IPv6 land and uh, we have assigned addresses, we've at activated IPv6, and hopefully we have an understanding of somewhat of what the address structure that we have is here. So it's time to pause for questions and uh, anything that Nalini or anyone else might want to add to that. Great. Thanks, Mike. So yeah, so I've got a couple of questions, which I think are important. And uh, um, so guys, guys, now, if if I don't get to your question, or if, or your question is like, um, how do I say, uh, too advanced, shall I say, 
then, and if you want to stay after, then um, Mike and I can stay after, and we can stop the recording and just have a discussion period. Or also, please do send me a note if you want to just have, like a, you know, at from time to time, just a, you know, like a, a general free for all, if you will. But you know, send me a note. But so let me, okay, so so let me give you uh, two questions that are important at this point. So first. Take a look at that scope ID again. If you, can you explain that scope ID again? Because I'm getting a question that says, now, what did you say that was? Okay, that, and that's a good question. And it's, it's, a, it's a really good concept, especially for IPv6. Well, it's kind of unique to IPv6. IPv4 does, <clears throat> excuse me, similar things, but it, it's an important thing to understand and we will actually talk more about it when we get into multicasting, which IPv6 uses a whole lot of. So, so let's go through again what, um, I'm gonna make this a little cleaner display. How does that sound? So let's go through our tree in reverse again. Um, and I'll actually include the, uh, the loop back just for one example because there's different scopes and the uh, the loopback is an example and one of the very few that I know of, of the host scope, which means this address is only good on this host. Now, another host may have a colon colon one, which is the loopback address in, in IPv6, uh, and, but that's his, and, and there are different addresses on different interfaces and different devices. So this address is only good on this host. Sounds pretty worthless, but we all know that there's occasionally some value in using a loopback address. So um, that's not bad. So the next step up is our, our, our link local address. And that's what got generated when IPv6 started, because he needs that for some of his underpinnings and, and base commands and things. And again, if you don't see this, IPv6 really isn't active. So you need to see at least this. And that scope is link. And link means the local area network. So basically anything that I can get to with a MAC address, anything that I'm sort of connected to, anything I don't need to go through a router for. Everybody has different ways of sort of describing that or thinking of it. And uh different terms that you link is the sort of the preferred ipv6 term but some people would just say on the lan uh or on that subnet uh so it's again anything that you're sort of directly connected to and um and whoever asked the question uh, you know follow up with if i'm answering the question well and understandably because now i'm, I'm just going to go to the the, the final uh, scope which is global and that's what our GUA or these addresses that we added next uh, that we paint Google with. Uh, global means I can pretty much go anywhere. Again, as I think I said earlier, you know, there's routers and routing tables and firewalls that may prohibit you from getting places that that still applies, that's still there, and that's still important. But this address is capable of going anywhere on the internet or on your local net, which is part of the internet. So those are kind of the three major areas of scope. And I'm gonna pause and see if there's any feedback to, did I cover that? Cause it really is a good question and really is important. Yes, no, that's a real good question. And you know what, I'm gonna stop. And I'm for, I mean, it's like, I've get, I'm, you know, I, as I say, we do wanna go on, but there's a bunch of seriously good questions. You know, I mean, not that, I mean, not that, not that they're not, they're always good, but there's some stuff that I think a lot of people, um, you know, would want. And so I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, a, and get those. So, so the other question is, okay, so, so you are showing those multiple IPv6 addresses. And so are you telling me that that same interface, that NIT card, that that um, um uh, where's that where that ethernet interface there 56 whatever whatever are you telling me those are all on the, all those have all those ipv6 addresses 
I'm kind of restating the question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and that's another good question because it's for me at least this is a pretty confusing topic. Because oh God, look at all those interfaces. There's gonna there something's got to be not right with that. So yes, they're they're all on that interface. If you were on another box, you could ping any one of these interfaces, and you'd get the same box, uh, the same server. You'd still be hitting this server. Uh, it, you know, we can do things with these addresses. Like you might want to have a web server listening on this address and a database server listening on this address. Again, it depends on, on your configuration, what you want to do. I'm going to say in most cases, you won't want this many addresses. There's certain situations where you want, might want more. And again, the important thing is that, you know, IPv6 gives you this flexibility. And, and, and we saw we can operate with just a link local address and not have any of these. It would limit what we do, but in some cases, that may be what you want. You might have some super secret secure server that only things on that subnet you want to get to. And guess what? That's the very best way, way better than a firewall or an ACL or anything else that you can do that because nothing else can do that. The protocol will prevent it. So um, again, I'll pause and say, did that answer the question? And so let me add a tiny bit to that because because uh, I got a, a, another question is like so I, I think you said it correctly but let me restate it I, I mean of course you did but let me restate it a bit in a different way because the question is what is the need for multiple global unicast so what Mike said is like you know like you may have a, a global unicast for a database server or you could have zones. For example, you could say, like for your um, uh, for for the internet, where you don't care if people see certain addresses. Like, mm -hmm. go ahead and use this global unicast address. And for business partner number X, use this a global unicast address. Uh, for the internal secure zone, use this another address. So what I see in a lot of places is people set up their firewalls, like they'll have multiple zones, like, you know, red zone, green zone, blue zone, and then also, you know, maybe by a trusted business partner out to the internet, stuff like that. So I, the, the ability to have multiple IPv6 global unicast addresses is, I think, underappreciated and hugely powerful. So, hmm. um, yeah. That, that's good. Uh, it, it made me think of an actual example that that, that I have is that, um, and I don't like this one, but uh, micro segmentation. It's something that all of us are being counted on to do, and and I'm not as convinced as many about how necessary it is. But uh, an example would be you might you might have uh, one micro segment that's database, one that's web server. And one that's app server and and the the others you're not supposed to communicate amongst the others and and so you could have one of these addresses living in each one of those zones and that's pretty similar to what nalini just said but it's it's a way way of uh, less painfully implementing micro segmentation and once again you, you don't have to do that we could have just one or two of these addresses but we that flexibility is there if the situation dictates it and I'll say one more thing that maybe drives all this point home, like can all these guys really be living on the same address, the same interface? And yes, they are, because if you look at the way this is stacked up, here's your ethernet address, here's your MAC address. All of these are sharing that MAC address. That's what this sitting on top of that MAC address at this point in time. So great, great. You know what? Let's let's keep going we could talk about this for a long time but let's let's move on and actually dis, dis, talk about about um you know uh, neighbor discovery because what mike has been talking about so far is two things he's been showing you um neighbor discovery in terms of both slack and also for um uh for fix and so mike is going to go over to the trace now and show you neighbor discovery. So, okay, go ahead. <laughs> let's let's do that. And and I'm gonna I'm just gonna say one thing before we go there. Uh, so, so um, here's here's our, our our local address, and and then we have this Slack assigned address. 
and then we have the statically defined addresses. What I didn't show is DHCP. We can't, and, and that's big for most of us enterprises, and we will probably use that with IPv6 as well. Uh, but I'm just not showing it here. We did not go so far as to set up a DHCP server, but it works fine there, and it, it works well in conjunction with uh, uh, IPv4 DHCP, and it works fine on all the uh, the DDI appliances if anybody's running anything like that. And I'm thinking of things like GUCAD and InfoBlocks. So know that that's there so we could have even more we could have a couple of dhcp defined addresses sitting here as well again don't get overwhelmed by that again we could only have the one or two addresses uh and it's the, the rest of this is just there if we need it so enough on that let's go to a trace and see what really happened behind the scenes here so while we were issuing these commands things were happening and, and we're going to go through a trace here, and I know that's painful, but uh, it's one of our goals with, with this and other webinars is going to try to desensitize a lot of us that are, you know, intimidated by or don't like traces to see that they're really not all that bad and they really provide a lot of great value and understanding to what's going on. So we're going to do that. Uh, I believe we have 23 packets in this trace. and. Uh, mercifully, we're only going to go over a few of them. So I'm going to be passing over a few of them and I'm going to just highlight a few things that I think are important to us as we start to deploy IPv6 and understand what NDP, the neighbor discovery protocol, is doing in our network. So uh, as an example, packets one and two, I'm going to skip over those, but I'm going to mention them because either Nalini or I may cover them later if we have time. We, uh, I think I speak for Nalini, I think we think that these are not, these first two packets are not terribly important, but you see them a lot. So we need to mention them and maybe understand why they're there and, and why we can feel safe to ignore them, uh, which is kind of my attitude. So the first packet we're really gonna cover is, is this one, number three, and we're gonna be mainly focusing on the details of the packet in here. So this, this packet, is uh, a neighbor solicitation and what this guy is doing with a neighbor solicitation is he's he's trying to find out uh if there's any other address out there like the one that he's presenting here so let's talk about a little bit about what it's doing some interesting things are here's our source address and that actually <laughs> It wasn't that long ago the first time I saw this, I thought, well, that's got to be a mistake. Well, it isn't. That's called the undefined address. And basically, this guy's saying, I don't really have an address, and I, I think I'm getting started, and I want to get one. We see this packet immediately after we, and, and hopefully you remember when we were doing the commands, we started or enabled IPv6. And this is the first thing he's doing. And, and, and we've said that a couple of times like we we're trying to get that link local that's the base of ipv6 we need to get that first before we do anything else fancier bigger or wider so this is him going out there and saying uh i don't have an address and i'm going to multicast this out to is the destination address is a multicast address i'm going to multicast this out to everybody to see if anybody else has this address so I'm going from an undefined because I don't have I'm, I haven't locked this in yet. I think it's mine, and I'm going to multicast it now. Nalini covered this in previous sessions, but I'm going to knock this home a little further because this multicast stuff gets used a lot in IPv6, and we, we need to understand it better. So here it is. FF is saying it's a multicast. Zero two defines the scope. So whoever asked that question, fantastic because we got to talk a little bit more and maybe two scope and zero two means the link as opposed to the host or global or, or anything else. So hopefully we understand that a little bit better now. And then colon colon one, one means all nodes. So it's all nodes on that link. So everybody that's attached to that link uh, should be listening to this and, and should be responding to this. And what is what else is important in this 
particular packet is the target address. And guess what this target address is? We've seen it a bunch of times when we were looking at the, the uh, commands and that's actually the link local that he ended up having. And this is his attempt to get this. And, and so the, the, the prefix is that he's a link local and the rest of this is generated from his MAC address. Well, he doesn't know yet. Maybe somebody else has this MAC address or maybe somebody else came up with this address uh, in, in some other fashion because you don't have to generate addresses based on the MAC address. There's several other techniques. I don't think we'll be covering that today, but I bet you Nalini will cover it in a future seminar because that's pretty interesting too. Uh, so he's basically saying, does anybody else have this? It's duplicate address detection or DAD. So if you hear people talking about IPv6 DAD, this is what they're talking about. Does anybody else got this? And I'm gonna pause after a couple of these packets to see if there's any questions to, to that particular packet. That one and this next one are pretty important. So I'm gonna pause after both of those and Nalini, did any new questions come in regarding this particular subject? Well, there's a ton of questions, and some of them, I'm going to say, are, are a little more complicated. And so hold on a second. Uh, yeah, is with there anything those... that's like basic that we should address right now that I might have missed um, that, that's important to understand with, with, with DAD? I mean, the most important thing in this packet is to understand what DAD is doing and or I'm happy to go back to any multicast or scope level things, too, because that, that also is really important for us to understand. So, so one thing I mean, what you what, one thing I might add is that that we will don't worry about the sixteen part. Um, at the very end, I will go back and show you how to go to the IANA registry so you can figure out what that sixteen is. You know, because a lot of times when you get stuff, you don't know what the the other part is. But I want to be a little cognizant of time and let Mike go through. You know, yeah, and so, I, I think so you're getting it there is, is packets one and two that we said we would skip but come back to later that we yeah. if we can. Okay, and, and, and let's, yeah. so, so that makes sense. Anything else on that the, before I go on to another packet? No, no, let's go through because we want to just at least get All through right. neighbor solicitation. I, I yeah. sense by the tones in your <laughs> voice that we're starting to fall behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to go to. I mean, we'll go right to the most important packet because I talked a lot about it when we were doing the commands and that's the uh, router advertisement packet. Okay, so when, when we were trying to get an address, we said we needed to talk to a router and we needed to wait for the router to send the, uh, the router advertisement message and, and, and lo and behold, here it is. Uh, if you look at the time field, a couple minutes went by in this trace before we got that with nothing going on because we were kind of waiting for it. So we either have to wait for it, which I think, as I said, on most systems, it's going to be like five or 10 minutes. It can be less. There's a parameter that you set at the router, et cetera. Uh, and, and, or we can uh, issue a command, which I did, to, to get it to happen a little quicker. So, so we finally did get it. And, and here's some of the important fields. So the source address is a link local. And it's not our link local. It looks dangerously close because, and that confuses at least me a few uh, quite a bit of the time. But this is actually this particular octet is different. This is actually the link local address of the router, and the router is sending to aha a multicast address. And let's go whatever he was. It's multicast. He the scope of this is, is the link or the local area network, and it's to all nodes. So he's sending out to all nodes, hey, I'm a router, you know, and, and I'm sending you a router advertisement and there's going to be a whole bunch of cool stuff in the router advertisement. So let's go through some of that. Here it is. Uh, and, and another thing I probably should have said earlier, in, and I bet Nalini covered in pre uh, previous sessions, is that a lot of how IPv6 communicates for his overhead information and administration information is using ICMP and, and it's ICMP v6. So this particular ICMP message is a router advertisement as, as we've been saying. And there's a bunch of pretty cool information in here. And remember this was when we were trying, we had our link local and then we were trying to get a global address and go on and do bigger and better things. And we were waiting for this router to help us 
get configured to do so. So here's a here's a flat. There's a there's a few things in here that I'm not going to cover. You know, hop limit and stuff. This kind of normal old old stuff. But here's some new flags. Uh, none of them are set currently. There's things like managed address configuration, which that would tell us if we were using DHCP. And there's some other configuration options. Home agent has to do with uh, mobile support, which is another good thing that IPv6 probably does better than, than IPv4. But none of that is set, so we won't belabor it too much, but we will belabor this. This is the biggest thing we were waiting for as a server. Router, send me a, a way that I can generate addresses. And so he goes, I'm gonna send you a prefix. And this is that same prefix that we saw before. And again, he's saying that here's your first 64 bits, which is the prefix. You can generate an address, anything within that range. Uh, the, the router is allowing you to do that. So he's sending you that, he's sending that to the server, and that's the main thing we were waiting for. There's a couple more things in here. Uh, here's another flag field. Uh, the more flag fields, the, the better, right? Uh, so basically he's saying, you know, this I'm, I'm a router that's on your link, so that bit is set, and I, I am capable of, and we are going to use uh, Slack or auto address configuration. That's set too. That's the the only thing that's set. There's a few other things. He reiterates the prefix, and um, and and that's not terribly important. But here's one that I think is. Remember, we ping Google, and at least I was mystified as to how did he know what Google's actual IP address was. All we had was a name, and here's the reason why. I'm more magic in that uh, router advertisement. Uh, he, he gave us a DNS server with yet another uh, global DNS address. So that's how we had that. Uh, and it happens to be a recursive server. That's good too. And I think the only other thing is that the router also tells us his link layer address. So we can store that in, in state tables. And I think that's all for that particular packet. Uh, so I'm going to pause again. That, that, I, I think that's probably the most important packet that we're going to cover. We'll cover a couple others if, if time permits, but, but that one's important. So I, I'm going to pause again here and see if there's any questions on the router advertising packet. Yeah, and I'm going to take one question on that, which leads to something which you didn't talk about, which I think is important. And so what the question is, some, the, and, and please stay at or the questioner, and, and we can talk about this, is like, um, should, you, should we, our router advertise a must? Um, because he, somehow he's on a network which isn't seeing it. And so please, please stay after and let's talk about that. Because um, because it may be a timing thing. And so Mike, can you talk about when you might or might not see router advertisements? Yeah, and, and that is a great question. I, I, I absolutely think we should cover it now. Everybody should be interested in that. So, as I said, when we were sort of waiting, uh, you know, the router is going to issue that every interval that he's defined to do so. Supposedly, the default in the industry and uh, IETF documents is supposed to be 200 seconds. Uh, this network seems to be doing it longer than that. We do not have access to that router, so I can't see it or set it, but it is a settable parameter if you have admin rights to a router. So you could make it less than 200 seconds, you could make it more. Why would you do that? Well, one of the reasons you might make it less is for people like us that we would need a new address and we don't want to wait five or 10 minutes. So you know, make it a minute. But for the most part, uh, when once you get an address, you're going to have that address for hours or days or even weeks. And, and so you don't need the overhead of that coming every few seconds. So you might even make it more than 200 seconds or maybe even more than 10 minutes. So it's kind of a situationally dependent thing and, and do what you think is best for your situation. So that's that's how you would set it at the router. The other thing you can do, and, and we actually did that, is you can have things happen on your server. I think we have an example of that coming up here in this trace. Things can happen at your server that will generate something called 
a router solicitation. And that's the server saying, hey, I don't want to wait. I want a router now. And, and, and then the router will respond immediately uh, to that router solicitation. The cool thing about that is if you do it, and I think we will see this, is that when, when you ask for it, only you get it. Otherwise, as we saw here, um, I got to page up a little bit. Um, and I got to page a little bit more. He said the router is going to respond and send this to, he's sending this RA from himself to everyone on the link. So you can say, well, maybe that's inefficient. And everybody has to process that. If, if only one guy wants it, let's, let's do it that way. So those are the two ways that it can happen. And, and the way that we got it to happen uh, typically is on uh, the way we did get it to happen was on a service restart, but a reboot, a service restart, and other, other events on that server could generate a, a router solicitation, which will then cause a, a router advertisement to flow back to him. Did, did I get it there? No, I think that's great. But because uh, because the, the thing is, is like you know, um, you may be waiting a while you know, for that router advertisement, which is, which, it, and it's set at the, you know, it's set at your router, you know, how frequently you're going to do that. And so that's, and, and so sometimes I know I've gotten into places where I'm like, oh man, it did not work. And then lo and behold, your router, router advertisement comes and then you get all your addresses. So definitely that's something to look at. But let me restate a couple of things that Mike is saying. So the basics, those three packets, and and that Mike has up neighbor advertisement, neighbor solicitation, and multicast listener uh, report. Actually, the multicast listener discovery packet. Those are the heart. Those are are the heart of stateless auto configuration, or what we call neighbor discovery. Uh, we we really shouldn't call. I mean, it's like because neighbor discovery is what we really mean by that is slack. Um, and and these are the three guts of it, and they're really, uh, it, you know, it, it, the, it, it's two different protocols, really, uh, the the neighbor discovery protocol and the multicast listener discovery uh, protocol. And and really, if you take nothing away from this presentation, but what the power of that router advertisement, um, that would be great because you see how much is in there, you know, your your prefix. If you're going to use DHCP or not, um, you know what is the prefix, what's the MTU, uh, what's the DNS serve. There's a lot in that that one packet. And, and I'm going to give you a big plus one on that. Thank you for highlighting that. That that is the important thing. And in the interest of time, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to like speed things up on on this trace, and I'm just going to cover. I'm not going to go into detail on any of the rest of the packets. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. So we will be done with tracing and everybody's going to clap now uh, within two minutes. I'm just going to say that so we, we covered packet six. I'm going to say packet nine uh, is, is, is kind of important. It, it's, the, um, it's the undefined address saying, OK, here's another address I want you to see if, if there's and do dad on or see if there's a duplicate only. This is the new one that I'm generating for my global address. So I took the prefix and then I took some bits from my MAC address and then I created this address. And he's checking to see if uh, if everything is, is copacetic with that. In other words, nobody else has it. Uh, he, he obsesses over that a lot, but it's kind of good for those of us that have shot duplicate address problems in, in IPv4. So you'll never see it again. Uh, so, so anyway, that's, that's packet nine um packet 12. Hang, hang. yeah go ahead uh, one one second mike i'm going to stop you just right there because i did get a note about this in the window um okay so that address that but well, why don't you point to that packet uh yeah that packet nine again the destination packet that you're saying it is accurate to call that the solicited nodes address. Um, that the front part is the FFO2.1 all nodes, but and so duplicate that's that's it, that, and that's the all nodes address. So it's a combination 
of, of the all nodes address combined with that particular device's, uh, uh, you know, whatever his, I, I hate to say MAC address, because it could not be the MAC address that makes it the solicited nodes address. And, and, if, and for, for people who are just starting out, if you want to ignore that, feel free to ignore it. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and to restate uh, even a different way, what, what we saw before was a neighbor solicitation for this. It, it's a very similar packet was for this guy. Uh, this is our server, the undefined address, because he's saying, oh, I don't have one yet. OK, well, the one we saw before that was really similar to this was him trying to get his link local when we re when we started IPv6. This one is for his global address. Now that he's got the link local and he wants to get that global, he created it. And here it is. And, and we could look in the details of the packet and see it, but it's the same thing. There's a, there will be a target address in there. And he's just, he's the same thing. He's saying only this time for the global address, does anybody else got this? And, and nobody else did. So on we went. Um, let's see, I was gonna go to 12, I think, because uh, we talked about this a little bit. Here he is doing a router solicitation. You can see another time gap occurred here. And that's when, I went ahead and did the service restart. And guess what? That generated the router solicitation. And guess what came back? A router advertisement. And, and again, uh, as we talked about a few minutes ago, this is not a multicast. Now he's, they're talking directly, link local to link local. It's more efficient. And it's because he asked for it. So this one is solicited. And so the rest of this, again, I'm going to roll through it. I'm going to go right to the end. Is basically him doing some more listener reports, some neighbor solicitations to look for dad. And then here at the end, uh, he's got another, a final neighbor advertisement that flows from the router to the server. Again, not a multicast, just unicast one-to-one. -one. And, and it's a neighbor advertisement. So he's saying, the router's saying, yep, you got me, here I am. And in the packet, you can see, thankfully, we don't have to go into the packet. He summarizes it here for us. He says, I'm a router, and you solicited this. So we're talking one-to-one. -one. Everything's done. Everything's good. And this is the last packet. Not only the last packet we're going to cover, but that this is the last packet in the trace. Once he was done, everything's up and running, and we are done. And, and uh, I'm done, so too, Lainey. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, that's so one thing, if you might show, is if you there's a couple of things. Is um, if you go back to your uh, to your command prompt, if you can show um, uh, uh, the the multicast groups that 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 the that the person is joining. I mean that ad is joining. That's a very important thing to do because see, and the reason I, I'm I'm kind of going off on this is that it's that's a new thing. We're not used to people joining. I mean your IP interface having multiple um, addresses and joining multicast groups. So that's a good one. Yeah, and and. And I'm about to hit enter on this, but before I do, I'm just going to say this command is is different in Windows and Linux, but uh, but this command works for RHEL and and for uh, in this case Ubuntu. So here it is, and basically I'm just using Netstat. I, I think most people are familiar with Netstat and, and the Netstat, and then the uh, the arg is minus g, which is give me all the groups that this guy's listening on, and and here they are, and you can see it's it, it, it this isn't quite as overwhelming as it could be uh and that's because this is a smaller server and he's only a server he's not a, like if this was a router so you, he's listening on all these all nodes um things because like here, here the loopback is listening remember the loopback scope was host only and that's what zero one is so aha he's listening there and uh and it all matches up and the rest of this is zero two, which means link. Um, and he's all nodes on that one too. So uh, if, if this was a router, you'd see things that have the two here. Uh, and and again, time permitting, Nalini is gonna cover some other things that, you know, like where there's maybe a 16 or other values here. So that's the display. If you do this in Windows, it's a different command, you'll see probably more than this and, and that's okay because he has different interfaces and he by default listens on, on more in, 
two more multicast groups. So that's that's the um, that is the multicast. Great. Group today. great, great, thanks, Mike. And so I'm going to switch over to me and then show you where where in the IANA register you to go to get that. But there's a super interesting question that has come in into the the. Uh, questions, which I think will be real interesting for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and say it, and then um, uh, and maybe you can talk about it while I'm getting myself set up. And so, so this is back on the solicited nodes. Remember the duplicate address detection thing, the FFO2 colon colon one plus your, your address there? Uh, what what this um, gentleman is saying is that is that it's important to know because there's a number of switches that still don't do proper MLD pruning because of the solicited nodes. And usually you can get thousands of these uh, solicited multicast addresses in a typical LAN. Of course, you know, you can get tons of these things. You know, it happens all the time. And then uh, what can happen is people say, well, the switch is not pruning things properly. And maybe the switch's MLD tables fill up and it breaks things very weird ways. Um, and so Mike, I'm gonna let you talk about that very interesting uh, question and comment. Uh, and then I am going to switch over and show you the multicast table. All right, I'll, I'll stall for you. So, uh, and, and we're actually, there's a couple different topics that, that conflate here. So, so we're looking at one, and I'm probably about to lose my display here. Maybe I have already. Are people still seeing my screen? No, people should be seeing my screen. Okay, well then, uh, never mind the command that I just typed in. So you you can also yeah. do a neighbor display. So this shows who what what we're listening on what we just saw, and then you can also do a neighbor display to see who you're actually sort of connected to. And if you have a big subnet or a big link or a big LAN, that can get to be a pretty big table. So I think that's what the question was largely about. The, the, the switch should control that to some degree because you can do a multicast ping and hit everybody there. You can even do a multicast ping. God only knows why they have this uh, and change the scope to global and ping everybody on the internet if routers and switches in between are coming to their senses and saying, no, I'm not going to forward this. So I, I think that's what the uh, the question was regarding and i think it's a really really good point so you could kind of do a dos on yourself if you're not careful with this stuff um well some of it you know and it's it, and it it can happen because like you get you have privacy addressing you know and depending on how often you change your addressing you know um and and if you're doing static addressing uh, versus, uh, you know, the privacy addressing, which changes all the time. That's when you can start filling up all these tables. And and uh, uh, as I said, this is this is what we should really do. This is a this is a rather advanced topic, but in but I I wanted to talk about it because it's a way that that neighbor discovery and understanding this is very very important because if if you have problems, they can be very unexpected. Expected. And if you understand the concept of the solicited nodes address um, and what neighbor discovery and you know how that communication works, you'll be in a in a better a better um, space to be able to understand because we can't possibly know all problems. But if you understand the concept, you know, then you'll be able to do it. Um, you know, to to you'll be in a position to you know fix things yourself. So let me do. I'm going to do one final thing which is the multicast space registry, and then end the formal part of the presentation, um, and then stop recording. And then whoever would like to, uh, you are more than welcome to stay after, and we will, um, we will talk about it. So this is important to know. You can go up to IANA and look at the multicast um, addresses where all of are defined. You'll see your scope, and then you'll see all these things like FFO1 colon colon one. I mean, what is one, what is FB, what is 6B, and all of those things. And when you really start looking at tracing, I tell you, you see, you're gonna see a ton of that. Like, if I can show you, where? Okay, so this is a trace on the time. And we're not 
and we'll get to it when we talk about um, DHCP6. But looking here, you're seeing colon, colon, two, 16, FT, one, colon, three. And, and the more that you're familiar with that multicast registry table, I think the happier uh, that, uh, that, you will, that you will be. Um, and so let me go ahead and, and finish up here. Um, and so, so the next session will be on address planning, um, and then we'll do a lab uh, following that. And um, uh, IETF is, is, was last week. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to contact us. And I thank you so much for everything uh, that you have done. And let me see if I can turn off recording now. And then. Melanie, could I, I just want to say one thing, and that's to thank everybody for attending and their great questions. And, and then one more piece of input I think we would be looking for is, was this helpful? Do you really like this geeky, detailed stuff? And the answer can be no, and, and then we don't do as many of these things or any of them. Or if everybody is actually loving this and you're gluttons for punishment like Melanie and I are, uh, then maybe we do more and maybe an NDP too for the, some of the advanced topics that some of these questions have generated. And again, just the main thing is thank you for your attendance. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, some people, that's kind of that's interesting. I'm getting messages already. The more detailed, the better. Yeah. <laughs> so great. The, the, the sick audience. <laughs> yep, yep. So as I say, give me one second and let me see if I can if, uh, turn off the recording here um and so think about if you've got any other questions one moment i have confused i've gotten myself completely confused here um let me you want me to talk while you're uh doing that because i was going to say one other thing oh please please yeah okay yeah, just gonna talk a little bit more about that that message that we ignored that you just talked about with the 16 at the end and, and it had to do with joining a, a, a multicast listener discovery router group, which we're, our server is not a router. So he's constantly telling everybody on the network or all the routers on the network that he doesn't want to be in that group. It's just he does it over and over and over again forever. And it just for me, it just strikes me as almost funny that he's doing it so often. And, and so we, we were trying to understand more about that and how to control it. And that, that's why we skipped over those, but then we would mention it at the end because you're going to evidently see a lot of it. And it's good to understand what it thinks it's trying to do and, and why maybe it's okay to sort of ignore it. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop.